This episode is brought to you by freedadcourse.com. You are always one conversation away from changing your life. And the power of hello is something that I subscribe to every single day. And I'm always saying hello to new people everywhere I go. Increasing your opportunity, increasing your connection, and getting access to the solutions to the problems that you are facing, whether you're on active duty or just beginning your veteran transition, or you've been transitioning out for 20 years. On the other side of hello are the solutions that you're looking for. Again, head on over to freedadcourse.com. Get your five-episode audio course to create more connection, create more friendships, and get back to living the life that you're trying to design. Your kid comes up to you and they they ask you to play or they ask you for your time. You have to mentally ask yourself or out loud, you know, say, what am I doing and can it wait? Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome back to Military Veteran Dad, episode 92. Guys, I'm your host, Ben Colloy bringing you another episode of Military Veteran Dad. And if this is your first time checking us out, I appreciate you stopping by. I know that you have choices when it comes to podcasts. There are over a half a million podcasts in the English language, and that number continues to rise. So I appreciate you stopping by. And if you've been a longtime listener to the podcast, I appreciate you as well. If you want to help support and share the show, I would means the world to me when a new fan, a new listener joins. And if you haven't left an iTunes review, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. I read every one of those and they help grow the podcast within the iTunes algorithm and help you get to more and more military veterans dads. This podcast and its mission is so close to my heart that every day I publish, every day I'm growing with this podcast just like you. This is a mission as much for you to come home as it is for me to fully come home and we're never fully done with that. So let's get into this week's episode with John. So this week's episode with John, we dive into two big things, time and intention. Time is something that is so valuable that we often don't slow down enough to really measure the impact of time within our lives and making sure that whatever that investment is, that we are having intentionality behind it. So I'm going to let the episode do the work. So let's get started with this week's episode with John. Welcome to the podcast, John. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm excited for the show. We are based on the conversation before hitting record. We are going to hit it off because I already feel like you're a friend that I wish I had a long time ago, but never actually had a chance to get to know. Go ahead and tell us a little about your background, your your military experience and your family today. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I spent 11 years in, in the Navy. I went to Virginia Tech, graduated in 09 and traditionally a clear surface warfare officer, didn't have kids then. I met my wife over in uh, Japan. She was also in the Navy, stationed out there, and came back, found my love for facilitation before getting out, and have been, uh, we started a family. My daughter turns four in two weeks and some change, and we only have one right now. And, you know, obviously before that, the, I think the dog counted for me until I realized that it doesn't count for a family uh, when you compare it to a, to a daughter. But I got out about six months ago. I'm now doing my own thing and doing the uh, as much stay at home, uh, hang with family as as humanly possible. Was that your plan to stay at home before COVID? Or did that just kind of naturally the way that uh, it rolled into play? So, I mean, what I do usually involves traveling. So staying at home for the most part is good. But, you know, sometimes you have to travel on like a 5 a.m. flight go to San Diego for like a noon, one hour, and then catch the red eye back. So no more of that. So all of that time adds up and I'm staying at home now. So I wasn't planning on it and I'm, I'm glad. I mean, probably drives my wife absolutely crazy that I'm home all the time, but, uh, but it's good. And I can imagine, cause I've had to do a couple of those cause O'Hare is my home airport and it's about an hour and a half away. And to catch a 6 a.m. flight that I've had to do quite often to Orlando, I've got to be out of the house by 2.30 in the morning to get there in time. It is not fun. It, I've done it three times now, and each time I'm just like, what did I get myself into? That, that coffee on the way to the gas, or gas, coffee on the way to there from a gas station is just like not that good in that early in the morning. 
and they get there and you, you're just dragging all day because you've been up so early. I don't regret those uh, or miss those long early travel days either. And, and for some reason, when you actually schedule it, you think to yourself, oh, this will be great. I'll be there by that time. I'll get some rest when I can. Uh, I'll, I'll be okay with a, a red eye. And it's just like, you're just screwing future self uh, when it actually takes place. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you on that one. So let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to the, before you were a join the Navy, what was your calling to join the Navy? What brought you to the military? So my mom spent 23 years in the Navy. My dad spent 32 uh, years in the Navy I grew up on ships all the time, you know, seeing my dad and whatnot. And I mean, something about getting a free education, going to the school my brother went to that I was in love with just sounded right. Um, You know, and my grandfather and on both sides and aunts, uncles, cousins, all in the military, I kind of just fell into it. Was there anything that you were like desiring to achieve other than just following in the past? Or was it just kind of like it felt right and you were just going to discover, like, did you know what you wanted to do when you grew up at that point? Or was it just like everybody else joined the Navy and they turned out pretty good. So I'm going to give it a whirl. <laughs> I, well, originally I wanted to stay in the whole time. I, I definitely, I wanted to do the same thing my dad did. I wanted to put in at least 20. And I think my original, like, my original calling was, I mean, every time that I would go to the ship, I would always talk to the deck plates, find out who was doing what, you know, get to know them and, and, and whatnot and realize that I could make a pretty big difference in their lives. And that's kind of why I wanted to do it. Just bringing teams together and to function, you know, better than they were before and, and add a little humor to things. And uh, that quickly transitioned from staying in forever to, as I'm sure you know, you you reach a couple bad apples, and I had a few in a row, and it turned me off from the from the whole thing. So, um, so yeah, definitely not uh, what I set out to do, but uh, I accomplished what I wanted to, which was help the deck plates, uh, you know, be the the screen between leadership and them, and vice versa. Add some spice to everything, and uh, make sure everybody has a good time doing what they're doing. I relate a lot to your to your story and a lot I don't think I don't think I've ever talked about the podcast but the very first NCO that I had when I got to Okinawa was one of those that you just didn't jive with he just used his power in a bad way and it made you feel like you're sick to your stomach and at the end of my time so he had went through a couple of different disciplinary things like he eventually the the rooster came home to roost and I ended my military career, not by like ending it, doing this, but it was like the last month in the Marine Corps, having to testify at his court martial for what he was doing on the island. So like in my three years being in Okinawa, like it was all kind of remembering this whole kind of like mini soap opera of Days of Our Lives episode that just kind of I was a primary character in. And it does leave a bad taste in your mouth. I've When I left the Marine Corps, I really didn't acknowledge a lot of even wanting to be known as a Marine for like 10 years, it really took me starting a blog and realizing that I could help veterans. And then this podcast, like me turning around and facing it and realizing that none of that shit defined who I am. It's not, makes me less of a Marine. It's just events. And just like everybody else has events in their life. It's, and it in some ways shaped me because it made me more resilient. It's the more shit you got on your life, the better flowers you can grow later on in life. So I mean, you just got to really figure out where the fertilizers got put down and figure out what you can grow from it. But I agree there, it, there are a lot of those kids. And it was one of those things that like, when you see people getting promoted just because like, that's also something that didn't leave a good taste in my mouth because when you have that leader that just doesn't work and he's getting promoted, like that makes, and I was also a hard time promoting. Like I wasn't good at shooting. I wasn't good at running, which made my rise harder. And I see other people just get it and didn't really do a good job with it. Like that also kind of just lets a bad taste in my mouth. So I, understand that that can be something that you have all these high ambitions. And I mean, I remember right after school, I came home for Easter service one time to visit my family on a 72 hour ticket. And I remember wearing my uniform and being so proud going to Easter service. And that was the last time that I wore my uniform at home because I think I just didn't feel pride to connect to it anymore after coming home from Okinawa during my different times. Cause it was just something I wanted to be away from the Marine Corps because it was a soap opera and I'd but I remember coming back home to a farm. I was 
just, I loved being connected to the farm and the simplicity of it. There wasn't a soap opera. It was like baling hay was my favorite pastime. And I got to do it for 30 days when I was on leave. And like, I felt like I had won the lottery on loading hay because it was a whole lot less than what I was dealing with over there. Yeah, I think we would need an entire, maybe two episodes on a podcast just for me to talk about my first chief uh, alone, let alone uh, discussion back and forth. So I'm with you all the way through that. Although I've never worn my uh, my uniform to to service, I bet my wife would have uh, would have liked that. But now I'm too fat, so I don't. I wouldn't even fit. <laughs> you don't look that bad unless your t-shirt just makes you look that good. I'm leaning forward. No, I'm I'm all right. I'm I'm uh and you're only six months out, let's be honest. I mean, unless you're just like <laughs> living Thanksgiving dinner every day. No, no, I'm good. So what so when you got out, it wasn't related to family. It was related to that you just no longer felt like you connected with what the Navy was bringing you. Yeah, I mean, you said it. I, I think I, I've always had this mentality that it's it's smarter, not harder. It's uh, just because you've done it this way doesn't mean you always have to do it this way. I mean, you've heard these things a thousand different ways on Sunday. And, you know, if if I could sit down and do, you know, some kind of plan that lets people go after lunch and then they're leaving before everybody else, but they get the work done, it's efficiently done, everyone's happy. Uh, why can't I do that? Why do I have to keep them there? Because everybody else is there. Go home and enjoy their family because we already take enough time when we're at sea from their family. <laughs> exactly. And and as a SWO, uh, you know, I, at least in my experience from all other warfare domains and, and whatnot, it's the, hey, guys, I only got like 20, 20 hours, uh, you know, and, and I only slept for like four. And then somebody's like, well, I didn't sleep for 24 hours. And someone's like, oh, that's nothing. I haven't slept for two days. And then somebody comes around the corner and they're like, hey, guys, stop complaining. I haven't I haven't slept for three and a half days and I only get two hours. You know, it's like, why? Why is this? Why is that what we're hanging our head on? Yeah. Why are you? Why is it a competition to see whose life sucks more right now? Makes me appreciate that Marines only compete really on push ups. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate push ups. So it's a good thing I didn't uh, become a Marine. But I mean, when you when you look at that. And you've got me leaving at two or three, which, you know, to the rest of the world, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're, you're doing that. It's like, I'm not being lazy. I'm actually attempting to figure out how to, to maximize your day, people, maximize the day, motivate people to, uh, I mean, cause time is really all that most people want. They want time to hang out with friends and family. They don't want to be moving ammunition all day long. So if you can, if you can just, you know, push through it as fast as you can and in a most efficient anyway. So, um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, I, I had a couple bad leaders. Um, you know, one that I couldn't believe I'd ever talk to again, just recently did, but I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for that occurrence yeah, they, they, right? it's interesting because we often regret like having those like God, i wish it was different but then when you look back like those moments force you to dig deeper 100 percent. like yeah. you excavated more of who you are to to bring more of that to the surface and if you it's also i i, I kind of tell the story when i was at my job that I, I left in january that i did wasn't always happy there but i had a lot of perks but at the same time i was just always kind of miserable i was always wanting something better and I got kind of described as like a diamond. Like I was a raw piece of carbon when I started there and that pressure and pressure of continuing to do work while you didn't necessarily like it, continuing to grow to find new ways to do your job and find enjoyment. All of that kind of really created the person I am today with all the random knowledge and person that I am today because that pressure forced me to dig deeper. And it's that pressure that converts regular carbon into a nice shiny diamond. So it's hard. It's easy to say that in the moment, but you have to look back and really appreciate and have gratitude for it. Cause otherwise it's just going to eat you up inside because while that sucked, it did happen for you in some way because it gave you a gift of and what we also don't talk about enough is those people, when they come into your life, they give you a gift when you, it's very difficult to appreciate because they're usually in your face or driving you nuts, but they give you a gift of knowing exactly who you're not. And sometimes that's more powerful than actually figuring out who you are is figuring out exactly who you're not. And we don't often have, especially if your life is flowing in a pretty good direction, you've got everything you kind of want. 
you're not really figuring out what really irks and grinds your gears. But the quicker you can find that out, the quicker you can avoid it, and the quicker you can focus on what really does get you going. Hell yeah. That's, that is my motto on... I feel like we should have known each other a long time that's ago. Why I, I, that's why I opened the podcast. I'm like, <laughs> we are. We feel like we should have been friends for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, I, I learn more of what not to do uh, or not be by other people than I do the other way around. And it's, it's kind of that, you know, to bring that full circle with what we were just talking about is uh, I got in trouble and uh, I was made to give training to something like 300 people. And the training was the most boring, overdone thing that you could ever do where it's like, everybody knows this. It could have been summarized in an email. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I was upset at first and then I go back to, to my room and I'm thinking for a while and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to show you, I'm going to make this the best thing anybody's ever gone to. It's going to be so fun that everything you do from here on out, nobody will ever want to go to because they know it can be done better. And that was my, my goal. And that was kind of the first time I realized, oh, well, damn, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at doing this. Um, and I ne- it never would have happened if they didn't uh, attempt to, you know, push me out in front of the bus for a couple different things. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it happened. Um, definitely would not be talking to you in this capacity whatsoever uh, if, if it hadn't, and I would have been out of the Navy over five years ago. Uh, and I wouldn't have been extended three different times and work for a bunch of different three stars. And it might've taken a lot longer to figure out what you're really good at. hundred percent. Yes. You waited another 10 years in the civilian world, figuring out how to work the copier. Thank God. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful for it for sure. It took me a long time though. Uh, I, I still probably hold a pretty deep grudge somewhere, uh, in the, in the depths of my brain uh, or my heart, but um, for the most part, I'm super, super happy that it happened. The moment that it's going to probably go away is you're going to hit a moment in your life and you're going to be able to tie a string back to a negative moment and realize that this moment right here was actually tied to a negative moment. And then you'll only have gratitude for it and the anger will go away. Cause like, right. Like there's different things in my life that I struggle to connect that full gratitude towards, but I understand the idea that it's there and you just got to kind of keep in the back of your mindset and it slowly chips away like a rock. But there's a moment where something happens and like even the ability to help veterans, like I wrote a blog post to myself a couple of years ago and it was entitled why I was worth it. And I'm writing along and this is a letter I'm writing to myself why I'm worth it. So it's completely in my own context, but it's in the context of a friend writing. And I, all of a sudden I write to myself early in life, people push you down so that later in life, people, you could pull people up. And like that gave all the crap that I went through in high school and early in life, just never feeling accepted. Like I needed to be at the bottom to physically feel what that felt like, because now I can see it in someone's face before they even think they're showing it. I can see it a mile away and I can reach my hand out and pull them up. And like all of that, like that, when that shrink connected, I was like, well, where the hell did that come from? Like, that was like the most profound thing I've ever put together because it just connected that shrink together. I want actually want to go back to something you dropped just a little bit ago about time. So time is something I talk about a lot in the podcast because fatherhood, the love that your kids feel is often defined by time. Your kids will tell, or they spell love, T-I-M-E. And we often think it's the things. We often think that if we're gone for eight months, we can just bring home and shower them with gifts. But it's actually your time, your presence. How did you get that gift? Because it's not standard operating procedure, especially in military, because the military creates a construct where you can actually just become a workaholic and no one's going to question it because you're serving your country. So the idea that your time matters and the efficiency of your time is something that's just like walking around the street and finding a diamond. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think this goes to the uh, reaching down and pulling other people up. I, I think if you find the right champion in the right place, you can truly be yourself. And so uh, I found that in the Navy where they realized that I was 100% of myself and could give not only uh, what they wanted, but I could give it to my best, best of my ability and, and put every piece of my heart and soul into it. Um, if they just let me be me, if they gave me time off, if, if I wanted to come in uh, in civilian clothes, which turned into three plus years of wearing civilian clothes, which turned into not even going to the building to work because they realized and trusted that I would actually accomplish what I set out to do and, and, you know, whatnot. So, the timing piece 
you know, and obviously people get upset about that when they realize that they don't see you for, you know, a month or two, and then they see you at the PFA and they're like, well, where the hell have you been? Um, but the timing piece, uh, I have always been bad about it. I have always been bad about my daughter wants to do something and I'm like, Hey, you know, in a minute or after I do this or after I do that. And I've been focusing on it a lot more in the last year, I'd say constantly, I've just been focused on, okay, well, if it's not this, what am I doing? What am I giving up to be able to, to spend that time? And, uh, ultimately found out that my passion actually aligns with that pretty well. I might be gone for a couple of days here or there, but then I have this massive amount of time where I can be home. And so I get to see her grow. I get to teach her new things all the time. Um, it's very rare that I'm gone for, for more than three days, four days. So uh, it's been, it's been awesome for me. And what you're speaking to there is that focus of time, that focus of being present. And the biggest lie that most dads tell themselves is that we need to be at work. We need to be in a mode of doing in order to feel more of who we are or to feel like we're actually doing a good job. I can't tell you how many especially as I've become more aware and just self-aware of my own consciousness and what I want to do with my life, I can't tell you how many more ideas I have playing Legos and going on bike rides for my business than I do ever sitting at this desk processing anything or creating anything even. Like I went on a bike ride with my youngest the other day and it was just like a 15 minute bike ride after we kids got out of the bus. And I actually was able to visualize from beginning to end this idea of a stay-at-home dad podcast to actually facilitate and take my life that I'm talking about and trying to build as a stay-at-home dad and enter that space, a little bit less veteran, but focus on just on the stay-at-home dad. But I had that entire idea. I had like, I could be that person because a lot of the stay-at-home dad network that I, I check into, there really isn't anything out there. And like, I had the whole idea from beginning to end while riding a bike with my daughter and it wasn't sitting at my desk. And it's where it's, and this is the other crutch that most veterans don't figure out when they're a dad is the key to process who you are, what you need to feel your emotions. Like it actually goes through your kids. Like the more times you come home and play with your kids or connect with your wife, the more you're going to feel less scared of what your emotions are feeling inside. And the more, but if you read off the instinct, you're going to push back, but you're only going to push back further and further. But the path to actually getting to where you need to go is actually through your kids and just playing Legos or trains. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and I need to get better about it. I mean, I'm one of the reasons Especially as an entrepreneur, like you, your best ideas as an entrepreneur can come from teaching your daughter to do unicycle right now, which is something you shared before hitting record. Heck yeah. 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 And I mean, to your point, you just, you came up with something while you were riding your bike. Uh, my daughter, uh, I told her in the beginning that she, you know, if she runs alongside me while I'm doing my unicycle, she's protecting me, making sure I'm safe. So she loves it. I'm like, hey, let's go out and do this. And that gave me ideas to do facilitation chip tips on a unicycle, which led to other stuff. I mean, it's to your point exactly. And it, I did not mean for any of that to happen the way that it did. It's just uh, the creative mind is, is amazing when you actually give it a chance to relax, for sure. And so many more examples come for your life. I'm sure there is a blog post of business that you can relate to the lessons to learn to ride a unicycle and like those types of things where you relate regular lessons to everyday life those are the ones people remember the most because they have an anchor point to remember it it's not just some random fact that you taught them about business it's wow that sounds really interesting riding a unicycle i wonder what's relatable to my business life and even as another similar example is this past weekend i focused on some landscaping now this landscaping project i started in june I procrastinated it over like three weeks in June because I hate landscaping. It stresses me out. I don't feel good at it. It felt like it sucks in the end. Everybody else's looks better. I don't have the right design. I don't have the right knowledge to pick the right plants. I overstressed it in my head big time. I've been, we've been in our house for two years and I just now started landscaping. Well, there was a pile of rocks. I got two yards of rocks. So we used some in June. The rest of the rocks sat in the driveway till this weekend. And 
it drove me nuts. It was a subconscious thing. God, I better get that fucking going. I better get that going. And I'm like, well, it's up here in Wisconsin. It's going to snow. This is a problem that's going to get serious. This has to get solved. There's no way I can procrastinate it any longer. So I was like, I didn't even plan it. I was just finished breakfast. Kids were at a, a staging point. I was like, I'm going to get a shovel. And I'm going to go outside and dig. And I had been thinking about how I wanted to go. So I felt semi-confident and I just started going at it. It was like eight o'clock in the morning and I finished the whole thing, rocks, plants, t- p- paper, the whole nine yards by seven o'clock at night. And my daughter made a comment and she's like, I don't think you've ever started and finished anything like that in a single day. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I have. Like, I honestly couldn't think of a good example that I had started and finished without somehow procrastinating. But I didn't feel nervous. I leaned into and I went, I learned a lesson the first time that I went to a Pacific Gardener place with nursery and knew their advice. I just took them to pictures and was like, hey, help me find the right plants. So I learned how to ask for help, which is something men suck at. And I had asked a couple of neighbors for advice throughout the summer. So I knew that I felt so confident doing that. And now that has actually helped flow into my business during the week because I did something really hard, not related to business. And that confidence just gives like, wow, if I can do that in almost 10 hours, what else could I do that I'm really not doing? And but that's the stuff that you don't really think about and you just get focused on the doing or the email or the work or you're sitting at your desk or all that crap that you lie. Like that's just your ego telling you this is where you feel safe and this is where nothing is going to go bad in your life. But it's those things that you need to do. Like that's where you're going to build all the dominoes that begin to knock down all the other parts of your life. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. That's uh, when when you compare... I mean, I don't know if I'll be able to bridge this gap, uh, at least articulate what I'm trying to, to, or what you made me think of just now, which is how do you take the, the work that you're doing? So part of me says, okay, I have to sit here and grind this out so that I can spend time, right? Like I have to do something at some point in order to you know, provide for my family, et cetera. So there's like this dividing line with where do you say, okay, enough's enough. I, I need to put this away. I need to go spend time with my family, et cetera. At the same time, you know, so I've been pulled back and forth between, you know, what's being a better dad, not spending time or spending time. And I think it all comes down to the expectation management and how you schedule things, which I, I'm just now learning, which is sad, but I'm just now learning that those two things put me in the position to, to succeed or fail every time. Like I now know don't schedule every damn thing for the entire day. If somebody says, Hey, I'd like to talk to you. It's okay to say, Hey, I I don't have time for the next week or two. Can you, can we throw on a schedule, you know, a week or two from now? Um, instead of going, Oh, I got to fit them in. And then I got to fit this one in. I got to fit that one in because what's going to end up happening is you're going to get to that day you're going to grind it out. And because you've made commitments now to other people, you can't make a commitment to your own family during that space. But while someone's asking you or sending you an email and saying, Hey, can we get together? You do have the ability to think about yourself in the future and go, okay, well, I don't want to do a you versus dinner (laughs) with my family. You know what I mean? I'm going to pick dinner. Sorry. Uh, And most people that I have found, they understand that. I understand if somebody can't talk to me for two weeks. I understand if somebody says, hey, I can't talk for a month. I get it. So maybe other people get it too. That's the type of mentality that I've had recently. And it hasn't disappointed. I think it also speaks to like the inner feeling of insignificance most men feel. That because we feel like we need this in order to kind of keep moving, or maybe we aren't quite as confident in our capabilities to provide and that everything will work out the way that it's supposed to. We think of the scarcity. And so like, we always have, I I know I felt it in the beginning, probably the first four months after leaving my job, because it was a matter of money. And then COVID hit and I'm like, oh my God, now it's going to get harder. And just, is this going to be a thing? Like before COVID, my thing, I wanted to be a professional speaker. Like that was where I put my eggs into it. And then with COVID, I was like, oh my God, everybody's telling me I can't do it. And I doubled down on it even like I was, I'm, I'm still committed to it. I just did my first one a couple of weeks ago and like, it's so in your head. And I remember different days with COVID and homeschooling. It was extremely difficult when I was trying to have a conversation. My wife was trying to teach the kids were all being crazy. I almost just kind of got to the point where I just defaulted to dad. 
whenever in doubt, I defaulted to dead because it was, especially as an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to build up a domino. Like, oh yeah, I got to do these 15 things and that's going to get me $1,500. It doesn't really work that way as an entrepreneur. It's, it's more random and it's more systematic that you just keep doing what you're doing. And then naturally the fruits come to you as long as you're showing up in the right way. And like what your head tells you you need to do isn't always where your head needs to be. And I defaulted on dad to support my wife, whether it be taking the kids or getting him out of the house, whatever it may be. I just defaulted to dad, even though maybe I did have to do something. And I'd be like, you know what? It doesn't matter more than my family. And all of the things I still have in my life, my life hasn't ended. We are still living in our house. We're not living in a cardboard box. And it all just worked out. But if you live in that fear mindset that there's not enough, or like another way I've heard it said is that whenever, when you see someone else win, say like if they scored a $5,000 client uh, in their business, like, oh man, that's $5,000 less than the market that I can get. I better hustle. Like you think of it as a finite piece of pie. When someone else wins, you no longer have the same opportunity to win, but that's really bullshit because it's this infinite pie of opportunity but our brain doesn't perceive it. And the, like the more times you have to just kind of be aware of it and dig into it. But I really appreciate that insight because that is something that it's like another similar example for anybody that works in the office. Someone walks in and says, Hey, can I take 30 minutes to talk to you about a problem? You don't even look at your calendar. You just stop what you're doing and you take it. But it's like someone just punched a hole right in your calendar and said, Hey, I'm going to take 30 minutes. And it just happened. And then you're at the end of the day, like, Oh man, I got to process email. I got to text my wife. I'm going to be late. And really what happened was someone came in and just robbed you without even really thinking about it. And you didn't even look to see what you were doing. And I, it forced me to, that moment forced me to create a habit, what I call budget your time, like I, your budget, your money. And so I would always like put blocks on my calendar of this was the project I was going to work on on my calendar. So if someone did come in or I got an email or someone wanted to drop a project on me, I looked at my calendar, like I've got two weeks of projects scheduled up. Or even if it was my boss, I was like, these are the three things that I'm going to produce in the next two weeks. If you're going to tell me that you need to do this, what are these three things that are lesser priority? But I always had that bigger picture so I could do that. But that's not how the mind works in naturally ways. Like you just want to be a nice guy. You want to be helpful. And you just say yes. And then you just be this guy that gets ran over all the time. And your family is the one that pays the price. You you just said, I mean, that that happens and has happened. So I just went to a, a leadership thing in Yellowstone where we were with seven other high-performing leaders, CEOs, uh, the bas uh, head basketball coach, head football coach of Montana State. And, and the thing that I learned the most, the biggest takeaway, so you don't have to go uh, you know, sleep in a tent or, or hike to learn what I'm about to tell you, uh, although I, I recommend it highly because it was incredible, um, is that that time management is – is respect for yourself. So for instance, something that I changed immediately after I came back from that is if I'm on a 30 minute call, guess what? I'm done in 30 minutes. It's over. I'm not going to spend another hour, which is what I've always done. I've always done it. Somebody says, do you have a hard stop? And I say, no, um, you know, something like this is, is different because I don't, and I, I enjoy it, et cetera. So you can pick and choose, but for the most part, a 30 minute call always turns into 45. Why? Because I enjoy talking. I feel like I'm relatively engaging. If I'm talking to somebody, chances are they want to talk to me. So it's going to go long if we don't have anything on the conversation is a drug. Yeah. And so, and then that 45 minutes, and then the next time you have a 30 minute one, and the next time you have an hour that turns into 90 minutes and you add all that time up. And at the end of the day, you're sitting there, it's five o'clock, you're an hour before dinner. And you're like, shit, I have to do all these other things before I can go to dinner. And then turns into, hey, can I have dinner up here? Turns into daughter's already asleep. Didn't get anything done. Why? Because I didn't say, hey, whatever we can talk about in, in uh, 30 minutes, we don't need an hour for. We should have scheduled an hour if we wanted an hour. And obviously, I'm still struggling with finding that, that perfect line there, but it has helped me a ton. I mean, big time. Every time I look at it and I go you just tell people, Hey, I, I'm done. And, and they generally minutes. the crazy part is they're fine. They're fine. They're almost <laughs> yeah, yeah. fine. And, and the ones that aren't say, Oh man, I'd love it. Is there any other time later today that we could get on a call? And if, if it is going really well, I'll go. Yeah. 
But I've tried very hard, especially since I got back from Yellowstone, to say, no, I, I, it's 30 minutes is 30 minutes. I've also realized that this is kind of like Kramer from Seinfeld, you know, where you where, where he slept, you know, a little bit of time over time to make it the whole night or whatever the heck that is. It's like, can you actually schedule a meeting for 10 minutes? Yeah. You don't need a 30 minute time block just because your calendar actually produces these 30 minute blocks or 15 minute blocks doesn't mean that you can't do a 10 minute. I've been sending like 11 minute, uh, 14 minute things because it's like, one, to be funny, but two, it's like, I know I only need five minutes to tell you what I'm thinking. And then if you like the ask, we can schedule something else later. But if you don't, we don't, we don't need to sit there and fill the time just because we had it on the calendar, just because it happens to fit in into a nice block, you know? Remind me, like it was like four years ago, probably there was a moment where I was in that email mode, like, oh man, my, I haven't even checked my inbox. I better text my wife until I'm going to be late. And it never went well. It was repeatedly the same catastrophe every time I texted, but I felt like I needed to. And eventually I was like, how dare I punish my family for my crappy decision-making during the day? And so I took Zig Ziglar's quote that failure is an event, not a person. Yesterday really did end yesterday and tomorrow is a brand new day as a kind of the mindset, like, okay, if I failed today, that just means I try better to tweak something, add a new process, add a new system, try something new. But I would just yank the plug at wherever I was at because I didn't have a job or anything was going to die if it wasn't done by the end of the day. And I just yanked the plug, walked out, and I was like, okay, tomorrow is I'll just reboot and try again and just get more efficient and recognize when you spent too much time with the water cooler and or just talking on the phone or BSing or staying too much on your phone all of those moments, you, you just re-engineer it every day and like not beat yourself up. Like it's an iteration process and like budging your time, like your money that probably took six years of failure to really get to that mindset. Like use your calendar, like a budget, like you tell, you give your dollars a job on your budget for your home. Well, give your time a, a job on your calendar. Otherwise it will find a home and it will find somewhere to go. Just like your dollars do when you wonder like, where the fuck did my paycheck go? Growing up as a military child, did you feel like you had a good example of, of balance or an integrated military dad, or was it kind of one-sided? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I mean, when you have somebody that's a career, you know, 32-year Navy guy, think about how many times he went on deployment. I mean, I couldn't even count. I mean, and they, they probably weren't nine, 10 month uh, deployments that they have now, but six months here, six months there grab another six month one. So you get the right position. So we don't have to move. Like it was always sacrificed so that the family could stay in the same schools, et cetera. So, so no, uh, I don't think it, it's the same. Um, is there a lesson that you brought out of being a military kid into your time being a military dad yourself that you were like, I'm no, I'm going to work and have some principle or some operanda that you were using in your head from growing up in that life. I think the thing that, I I have maintained whether I was in service or, you know, recently since I've been out and, and before that is that people are people. Every time you meet somebody, they were in a position uh, of, of struggle at one point. They're in a, a position of leadership or followership at another and they have a mom and dad or, you know, people that raise them. They have kids or people, you know, like everyone's, everyone's got a heart somewhere. If you can tap into the right thing in the military, anyways, you can get more accomplished. You know, like if, if we are humanizing to, to one another and you find that leader that becomes your champion because they, they recognize what you're attempting to do. Uh, it's a huge win. Although it's a huge loss if you don't find that person, uh, and you confide in, in certain leaders, for one thing or another that, that don't pan out that way, which is what we were talking about earlier, where, I, you know, I did not have a good experience because uh, I'm convinced the person that I'm talking about is not a human being, which goes against everything I just said, but um, uh, I'm just kidding. But it's um, the, the people thing. Everybody, everybody comes from their own struggles. Everybody has their own dark side. I always like to say, you never know what it took for someone to put their pants on that day. Yeah. It, and the military is, is no different. Um, you know, once you start actually hearing what some of them say, either after a beer or two, or, you know, on a, an eight hour flight or something like that, and you're overhearing some of these things, you're like, okay, 
it's having a facade is okay at, at certain phases, certain things that you got to do. I totally get it. But sometimes being human, you know, and, and letting people in is another way to, to lead. Yeah. And that's not like something the military does well. I always envisioned if I was a commanding officer joining a unit, the very first day that I was to change command ceremony, I would lead with my worst dad moment. Because I would just, because as a dad podcast, I would, and dad, and fatherhood isn't talked about in the military. It's not even something like people can talk about it as, as like shop talk, even like most people aren't talking about the, how their weekend was with their kids. And I would just want to lead with that. Like we are all fathers. We are all mothers within this unit and we we're all struggling at home and it's okay to talk about it and admit. And I would always just want to be that beacon that would like just to pierce vulnerability right into the beginning conversation. Like if this guy can admit that, I wonder what I can do. And that's not what most people do as commanding officers, but that vulnerability is something that is missed within the idea of fatherhood and parenting within the military, because there's just not a safe place to admit that you, you had a rough weekend as a dad or your marriage was in a rough spot that weekend. You have to pretend that you have it all together. And all that does is build up a house of cards that eventually gets blown down. Yep. So are you going to tell us what it is? I, you know, I don't, I know you're asking me questions. Am I allowed to ask you? Uh, what my worst dad moment is? Yeah. Can you want to tell us? I don't think I've ever categorized. I've always told the story. <laughs> I don't think I've actually picked the story. I think well, probably when my first epiphany or when I was really struggling and it wasn't like a bad, a, a super bad dad moment, but it was one where I was really struggling as a father. And it was when I first turned 30 because I had this fear of going through my head that like I was kind of shadowing the rest of my life. It's your first midlife point. At that point, no one cares when you turn 20, but 30 is kind of like, okay, I'm moving forward. And I just felt very alone. I was like, I think I'm going to reach the end of my life and no one's going to give a crap that I lived. And I just looked at my daughter and be like, who am I? Who? And she was like two at the time. I was like, who am I to you? Who am I to anybody? How am I going to be capable enough to lead you and, and let you grow up as a strong woman when I don't even feel capable of leading myself. And like, that was the real pit that all of my story really kind of turned from because it was from that pit that I realized that I don't have any friends in my life. And this is why I feel alone. And in order to actually have people care that you're here, you actually have to have friends and have a conversation. And I realized that every person in my life was a high school girl that was going to say no. And I just would avoid it. And so I had to go through all that fear, but that real first pivot pit was, like a really bad day. I remember a second bad day where it was just a bad dad day. And I think it was probably like three or four years ago. There's like a few days right before school starts where daycare closes for training right before school starts, which is crazy already. And my wife's already in school and they can't take vacation. So I had to take vacation because the kids need someone to watch. And it's, I think the kids, we probably had like a one-year-old, maybe a four-year-old, maybe a five-year-old at the time. And I just remember nothing going right. I remember yelling a lot. And I just remember thinking, and I remember texting a few friends at the time that I had. I was like, this was just such a horrible day. I feel like a bad dad. I didn't do anything right. And I felt like a complete failure. And if I actually think about it, it was one of the first few times where I was on my own for the entire day. And it kind of like that building block is now moved up into where last year my wife went to China and I was on my own for 10 days. And now I'm on my own for, I just did it for two weeks while my wife was going to work. The kids were with me every day and we had amazing memories. Like I was reflecting on a little bit as school was getting ready to start. And I was like, man, that was a bad day about three years ago when everything was kind of falling down and I just had no control. They were just round the house yelling at each other. And it just, you just felt like a, crappy father and like that's a horrible feeling to have that's probably my double bad story there nice good i don't know if uh, anybody asked you the questions this is where we switch i now start asking you questions for the remainder it's happened of- a few <laughs> times that people have switched and asked me up a question or two you got any other question you want to ask i'm not against it if it comes up i uh i will not be afraid to to throw it back at you though for sure got it well, a couple other questions that I want to ask. So while you were deployed, what year, how long were you married while you were both? Well, so we spent, if you add up the first four years that we were both in service, we spent, or together where we knew each other, we were physically, we were able to see each other for four months out of four years total. 
if you add it all up. So nine month deployment straddled by a nine month deployment, those type of things. Um, so she spent six years in, so five years. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had to do the public math there. So I've had a few conversations with people where they're both serving in the military. What's a lesson that you learned that you can share with dads of when you're actually your spouse and you were both serving? Like, what's a lesson that you wish someone would have told you when you first met of like, this is going to make your time serving a whole lot easier? It might not, it might not directly relate to family immediately, but it could be a long-term thing is when, when you have dual mill, two, two individuals that are in service, you're making a lot more money than the average household. And it's something that I absolutely wish I knew then where it's like, you don't have to go spend that money. Like we saved a lot of it. I, I will say we, we saved probably more than, more than average, but we could have saved more. We could have uh, created something different in that time frame, or so take the other side of the coin, or we could have traveled more. We could have spent that money Experience on more more memories and, you know, all, all of those things. So if I had to go back and do it over again, and I could instill that in my, in my head is you are making, you're making a lot of money right now to individuals, um, in service, don't mess it up or pretend like one of them doesn't exist. Pretend like one of the incomes is not even there and either put it in savings or, or put it somewhere for a rainy day. Like, I would definitely do that. I don't know if that's the right type of answer you were looking for. I think it is. And if I were to dissect it using my dad intuition, (laughs) I would say what you're also talking about is slowing down, smelling the roses, appreciating more this opportunity and season of your life. Because I can imagine with the four-year-old that you're like, God, life was a lot simpler when we had all that cash and we didn't have all these bills from all these toys and crap that your kids want to go do. And because kids get expensive and you're like, man, it was a lot easier when it was just us and we had cash and we did it like, it's easy. Like even podcasting, I think of how many nights and days I sat in Okinawa, just bored on my mind. I'm like, God, I could have created an amazing podcast during that time. Yep. And a podcast weren't a thing in 2004 and 2005 yet, but man, like that time I could have did a lot of different things other than sitting there and play Xbox and yep. like all of those different appreciations for it uh, are definitely there. And you actually speak to some advice that I got from where I used to work was headquartered in Czech Republic. And they taught me this lesson that they spend almost all their 20s finding the person they love and just extremely sp- enjoying life with that person, like learning how to fall in love with that person, do amazing things. And they only ever really even get married or even have kids when they're in their 30s. Like they travel the world, they do vacations that most Americans would think they're nuts. And like they just build that deep foundation with themselves while they have the time and money before they start adding all the extra stuff and it's that kind Damn, of that's it's, awesome it's, it's those roots that like i believe it's those roots of regret that build the 40-year midlife crisis because <laughs> we didn't have that big foundation we didn't take that opportunity and i mean 20 years is a long time for one kid before you can start doing things on your own if you start having kids the timer just gets keep getting longer and longer but you don't really have that awareness and like for me and like when i teach my kids this idea it's going to be, make sure you slow down. I want you to enjoy seeing life. I want you to get out there and don't feel like you have to rush towards anything. Like when I got out of the military, I wasn't dating during the Marine Corps. So I felt like my life was on hold. Everybody on Facebook was getting married. A few had kids and I was like, God, I got to catch up. And I was just boom, 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 boom. And I had a kid by the time I was 28. And I just looked back and I was like, God, I, what was I running toward? I was just running towards competition and keeping up with the Joneses, which doesn't actually get you anything. Yep. And I wish I would have slowed down and just enjoyed doing random things and yep. just experiencing things in different ways during that time first getting out. Like it's all about like tap sales, you get a job and then you just start copying what everybody else is doing, which is debt and car payments and house and kids and marriage. But you never just focus on the pure love of a relationship. And that's what I want my kids to take away. And I think that's what I would maybe overly translate. I probably added a little bit in there, but I think that's what you're talking about is slowing down in that season and appreciating the opportunity you have. Yeah. You know, I I have been on uh, several podcasts before you and maybe one other person can beautifully take what I say (laughs) and say it better. So what you should do for this is just cut my portion out and then have a little uh, segment that says, John just talked about, and then just put your own crap in there. Uh, just cut mine out entirely. Yours is a lot better anyways. <laughs> yeah, but you spoke to the money component. I didn't add any of the money component. I went down into the emotional roots of what you're actually regretting. 
at this at the level one, you were talking money, but at the roots, you were talking like, I wish we would have fallen a love deeper level before we actually moved on to life. Yeah, I love that. And it in both being dual military, like life moves so fast, like you often don't feel like you can slow down. So having that awareness that like we need to put it in neutral and just kind of I've also heard it said like don't focus on climbing the mountain so fast that you forget around turn around and enjoy the view. And I think that's a lot of what you're speaking to too, that there was a lot of opportunity with great views during that time. But you're one, you have disposable income. Two, you've got more of it than you've probably ever had in your life. And we're dumb and stupid in that way and at that type of age. And you just do what everybody else is kind of doing. And I mean, there were so many people in Okinawa that were just, their room was empty because all they did was they bought their games and did it and drank it on the weekend. Or at the time, World of Warcraft was extremely popular. So <laughs> they buried all their money and buying gold on World, World of Warcraft. <laughs> when you fast forward a little bit more, what was your process like coming home back to your family after deployment? Because that's something that military dads struggle with a lot too, of reconnecting emotionally, especially your wife kind of has to be the feminine, the masculine of the family. She's already kind of doing dual roles. And if you're a facilitator, you're probably one that goes in there with the default mode of like, I'm going to help try to tell everybody what to do, or maybe just try to figure out what I think is the right thing to do. So what does that process look for you? And maybe what's a piece of a lesson that you could share with dads and what you learned from coming home in the good way and the bad way, if there's also some things to avoid. I, I would say uh, it goes actually back to something that I said earlier, which is the expectation management thing. Like, you can't necessarily accept, expect to come back and have everything be identical. It is similar, but a lot different than having that best friend that you haven't seen for, uh, you know, four years and you meet again and it, you picked up where you left off. You can do that, but there can be some other things along the way, which is what are we going to do when we get back? What are we going to plan? Where are we going to go? And, and you can have those conversations prior to getting back so that you can ease into it. I mean, it's a culture shock coming back to where you live when you've been floating and getting seasick for the last, you know, six to six to nine months going to port visits and stuff without the the person that you're married to, you know? So uh, I think having those conversations is, uh, is a big deal. Make sure that you actually, you know, discuss what's going to happen because I got to tell you, there, there have been a couple of times where I came back where it's like weird, not, you know, nothing against me or, or the other side. It's just like you come back and it's, I don't remember how to not cuss. Like I'm talking to a bunch of my guys on the deck plates, guys and gals. Like, I don't remember how to relax and not be working. I mean, you wake up your, your computer is in your room. You, you, you literally only chance that you ever get to relax is breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe working out when you're on deployment. And so you have to come back and realize, okay, well, it doesn't have to be like that. I actually have weekends now we can do stuff. So, um, I think just being transparent is, is what I would give as advice for sure. And something I've had to learn the hard way is if you think of the word expectation and agreement, that usually what happens in our natural psyche is expectations are the nonverbal. You've actually never verbalized it. You just assume that this other person reads your mind and it's the agreements that you verbalized and un understanding. And you've kind of come to a, like, okay, yeah, I agree. I can do that. Or I agree that let's try to do that better or differently. It's when we use it because no one likes coming up and say like, I expect you to have this done. I have, it's kind of like the dad that walks in, like where's dinner on the table? Like that will never end well. And that's an expectation. And those expectations isn't something that's going to make a stronger marriage. It's just going to start to erode it. But an agreement is a teamwork. It's you've both agreed that you're part of the team. You're picking something. And so whenever you feel that expectation word floating in your head, nine times out of 10, it's something you've not verbalized and you've almost missed it because one, you didn't verbalize it. And two, you just needed to switch it. Like instead of an expectation, it needed to be agreement but somehow our brain often goes towards expectation. I'm not exactly sure why, but I know that it happens very often in, in my life. And I think maybe it comes from work because you just expect people to do their job and we apply that same framework when we come home, but our wife isn't our employee and we shouldn't treat her like one. And that's often where we step on a landmine and blow our leg off and hopefully we can get it reconnected. <laughs> the damage isn't uh, too long there. And there's something else that you were talking about of 
trying to figure out what that you were kind of different people. There's something that I, I don't remember who gave me this advice, but always approach coming back. And you probably even could use this advice with coming back from when you're uh, training. Approach it with a deep curiosity of what life was like while you were gone. Instead of like judging or instead of demanding, just try to approach it with curiosity because she probably had a bad day and you didn't know about it and she didn't feel like she could share it because she maybe you subconsciously expect her to just have it together and that's what she's always been to you. But there was a bad day and like approaching with curiosity to really get that out or even if your daughter's a teenager at some point, like coming home and figuring out like she had a bad day at school and she was afraid to tell you, figuring out that that happened, especially if you're like six months gone, like there's your, your kids are going to have bad days that you're, they're going to wish that their dad was there. And if you don't create that space to just kind of hear them and be curious about it, you don't allow that empathy to build. And I kind of talk about it as like an empathy bridge that if you both can build this empathy bridge based on curiosity of what your life was like while you're deployed and what her life was like while you're there, it allows you to find some common ground to move forward again. But if you come back and you're both kind of just trying to figure out who's the boss more, like you're just going to boss yourself into a, an oblivion of a corner and you're like sleeping on the couch. Where, where was your podcast, uh, you know, <laughs> five years ago? No, this is, that's, that's great. It's definitely something that I wish I could go back and tell myself. So as we ramp up the podcast, what is a parting piece of advice? If you think of your four years as a dad, your time as a husband, if you were to compartmentalize a piece of wisdom that every dad needs to make sure they get into their life as a daily habit or whatever it may be, what's that piece of advice for you? So it was probably the best advice, advice that I ever got. And I'm, I'm going to botch how they said it to me, but it's something to the effect of uh, when, you know, if your kid comes up to you and they, they ask you to play or they ask you for your time, you have to mentally ask yourself or out loud, you know, say, what, what am I doing and can it wait? And if you ask yourself that question, what am I doing and can it wait? Meaning, you know, if they want to steal me away from the computer. And my answer is I'm answering emails and the answer is no, I can't wait. Then, okay, maybe you have to submit something. But chances are the answer is yes, you can wait. And if the answer is yes, you should get off the computer and, and, uh, and go hang out with your kid. And uh, the, I mean, it, it sort of pairs with the other advice, which is, you have to ask yourself, what is more important? And if the answer is, is the work that you're doing, you have to mentally say, you know, in your head, what I'm doing now is more important than my kid. And when you do that, you guilt yourself into getting off the damn computer and going to hang out with your family. And uh, I've caught myself numerous times going, shit, I gave a, pa- a bad answer for that. Turn, turning this off, going to go hang out right now. Unplug. So... And I'll give you even a little bit extra sherry on top of that. I had a child psychologist on like we in the podcast last year. And she taught me that a child world can be changed as far as love and feeling and connection in as little as 10 minutes. So like you think in your head, oh my God, she's going to ask for an hour. We actually call it 10 minutes. That's what she calls it, 10 minutes together. And like, that's what my, I, I get asked multiple times a week. Kate, hey, dad, can I have 10 minutes today? And like, I literally will pull on my phone and I'll set a timer for 10 minutes and we can get a lot done and we can get some Legos built in 10 minutes. We can get a train set built in 10 minutes. Their behavior is almost the opposite. And usually whenever the behavior is acting up or they're like just bouncing off the wall crazy and not listening, it's usually a deficit in the time deposit. So like 10 minutes can be better than a timeout for one minute and just takes those 10 minutes to do that. I really love that advice because you're right. It's, we can come in and it's just, it's so easy to prioritize work because that's where we feel where we need to be. But there's a quote that I don't remember how it popped in. I think probably I was playing with my kids and it popped in my head. And it was what we do on this earth is important, but what we leave behind is 10 times important. And it's only when we show up that we really start to shape who we leave behind. And it's not going to happen while you're processing your email. It's not going to happen while you're bringing home a paycheck it's going to show up when you show up in their life and help them figure out who they are. Boom. I love that. Well, John, I really love this podcast. This is definitely going to be the first 
maybe the first episode, but I'm positive we're going to keep talking because like I said, in the very beginning, we should have been friends a long time ago. And I'm glad it happened now because now we can start making up for lost time. But I definitely feel like we are brothers from a different uh, life together. Heck yeah! And so I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and being vulnerable and sharing some of your stories as well. Glad that you had me over here. I I'm, I'm, uh, had a great time. Maybe next time we can talk about DIY jungle gyms and and uh, stuff like that. But uh, this was great. Oh yeah, I forgot to even ask you that, but we got so <laughs> caught up on some of the other stuff. But maybe next time. That sounds awesome. Um, I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you guys for checking out that episode. I hope that you enjoyed it just as much as I did. One, recording it, and I always love re-listening to the episode because I find more value in it the second time, just like you when you listen to it. There's so many little nuggets. Some of those little nuggets for me was... I talk about a lot in the podcast, but not a lot of people realize the process of who they were before they joined the military. That was a question I asked, John. And if you are in the part of transitioning or whether you're thinking about transitioning or maybe you've already transitioned, it's never too late to ask yourself, who were you during the first transition? Who were you when you joined the military? Because there's a lot of emotional questions that you can go back and really dive into. Are there things that I haven't accomplished? Are there things that I wanted to do that did and maybe what could have been better? Go back to that first transition before you focus on your second transition. Being an outlier in the military service, that's something that's not often easy to do, and we often don't feel like we have permission to do it. And talking about, is there a finite amount of money in the world? That is something that many people struggle with. It's something that I've struggled with. I grew up on a farm, and on a farm, money was not always there, and the amount of work that you put in does not equate to the amount of money you earn. So like, that was something that I had to overcome on my own. Sharing my worst dad moment, that wasn't something I was expecting to do, but on this episode, I did that. So I hope you enjoyed that. And like everybody that listens to this podcast might think that this world that I live in is some rosy thing, but it is not because everybody's life has the ups and downs. There is no unicorn world where all the kids do exactly what they want. And this is life and you need to embrace it. And you, the biggest thing you need to remember when you have those low moments is figure out what you can learn from it. So guys, go ahead and head over to the show notes because I've got all of John's links down there if you want to connect with him. He is an amazing individual and I loved having this episode shared with you guys and I will talk to you guys again on Friday.